Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Well, for those of you who've been geeking out on this channel or many other channels, you know that last week, April 11th, the Department of Justice, led by, yes, your Attorney General Merrick Garland and the ATF, published their new rules that will go into the Code of Federal Regulations and essentially redefine firearms and firearm components. It has set off a panic spree amongst many lawful and responsible gun owners who believe that the entire world is coming to an end. Am I going to defend that law today? No, I'm not. But am I going to dispel a few of its rumors? I think I may. And that's why we're going to have a very important discussion today about all the important details of ATF's new rule on frames and receivers. Okay, before we get rolling, you guys know the drill. If you like this video, go ahead and click that like button if you want to stay up to date on issues related to your Second Amendment rights, especially with this war path that the ATF is on. Go ahead and click that subscribe button. Click the little bell logo if you want to be notified when we post new videos. And most importantly, let's keep the comments and discussions coming. That's how we're going to make sure we're getting our videos out to more lawful and responsible gun owners like yourself. Okay, Dateline, April 11th. Uh, as promised, Merrick Garland, your Attorney General, and the Department of Justice, as well as the ATF, did release their new proposed rules to the Code of Fed Regulations, redefining firearms, redefining frames and receivers, redefining a lot of things, and sending all of us into a large panic mode. Now, uh, I had an opportunity to actually go through and read all 364 pages of the proposed rule. Why? Well, because I geek out on this kind of stuff, and and it says a lot about me. But anyways, listen, there's some nuggets in here and some things I want to share about you. So rather than you having to read through all 364 pages, you can take my word for it. Now, I'll actually give you the page citations where I found this. And of course, the link to this entire report is going to be down in the description box down below. So with that in mind, let me tell you about some of the nuggets that I did find here. Number one, the ATF has readily admitted that any assault rifle ban is likely unconstitutional. You see, in this full report, the Attorney General is tasked with actually responding to the 290,000 plus comments that were given by members of the public, members of the FFL industry. And in, in response to some of these comments, some of these rules actually re were reworked at the last minute. Some of these rules actually were given uh, new language at the last minute, and it actually does assist some of the people who had lodged some very legitimate complaints about some of the language that the Department of Justice was choosing here. Um, but one of the very first things that the ATF, that the, your Attorney General Merrick Garland says, in supporting this legislation, in supporting the need to redefine all the terms, was the following. In the past few years, some courts have treated the regulatory definition of firearm, frame, or receiver as inflexible when applied to the lower portion of the AR-15 type rifle, one of the most popular firearms in the United States. If broadly followed, that result could mean as many as 90% of all firearms, i.e. with split frames or receivers or striker fired, in the United States would not have any frame or receiver subject to regulation. Now, what I want you to focus on, though, is when Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, uses the following language. When applied to the lower portion of the AR-15 type rifle, one of the most popular firearms in the United States. So that is our Attorney General stating the obvious, which is that the AR platform is one of the most popular rifles known to man here in the United States. Now, why is that important? Well, there are many in the gun-grabbing community who believe that a well-regulated militia is actually a conditioned precedent to the right of the individual being able to possess firearms. Now, we know that to be ridiculous for multiple reasons, but most recently we know that because Justice Scalia in District of Columbia v. Heller specifically stated the following. We also recognize another important limitation on the right to keep and carry arms, as we have explained, that the sorts of weapons protected were those in common use at the time. Justice Scalia also stated, The review of the case law has made it clear that the types of firearms protected by the Second Amendment include those in common use at the time for lawful purposes like self-defense. So why is that important? Well, we have our current attorney general stating that the AR 
uh, rifle is one of the most popular firearms anywhere in the United States. And we have in the last significant Second Amendment, uh, Second Amendment opinion published by the United States Supreme Court, we have Justice Scalia saying that the Second Amendment clearly protects the types of firearms commonly in use for those people such as you and I for use in self-defense. And the Attorney General has now already admitted that the AR-style rifle falls into that category of firearms. If that's what the Second Amendment protects, and we now have AR bans in states such as California, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, and certainly there are many other states trying it, including my state right here, Washington, which has tried it two years in a row, most recently with Senate Bill 5217. So yes, the first nugget to be found on page five of this report is that the Attorney General acknowledges that the AR-15 is one of the most popular rifles in America for self-defense. Okay, the next piece of very important information comes off of page 259 of this report, and this goes to a question that many of you have. Are any of my guns that are right now untraceable actually going to be grandfathered in, or do I have to serialize all of them? That was a question that was raised by thousands and thousands of individuals, and in response to a question about gunsmithing and the number of firearms that actually will have to be serialized, the ATF on page 259 states the following. The final rule clarifies that Type 1 and Type 2 FFLs that do gunsmithing work that includes marking services for non-licensees are not required to apply for a Type 7 manufacturer's license. And this is the part then that I really want you to pay attention because the next couple sentences state, ATF reiterates that personal made firearms for personal use are not required by the Gun Control Act or this rule to be serialized unless required by state or local law. Instead, serialization is required only for those that are taken into inventory, which, as the final rule clarifies based on ATF's long-standing view, does not include same-day adjustments or repairs. So, huge nugget here. What does this mean? If you have an untraceable firearm, that is a firearm, that was built from an unfinished frame. A receiver does not have a serial number on it. Do you need to serialize these firearms in order to keep them in your personal possession? The answer to that question is no, you don't. If, however, if, however, after this rule goes into effect in August, August 10th, when this rule goes into effect, if you have one of those firearms delivered to an FFL for purposes of repairs, and it's going to stay overnight, it's going to get booked into jail like it got arrested, it's staying overnight, at that point, the FFL is required to serialize. If it's going in and out the same day for repairs, it does not need to be serialized. For those of you who have a large collection of these firearms, you probably already know how to do most of the repairs on the firearms. I think if you don't, the time to start learning is right now. But listen, this is huge because I have been contacted by hundreds of lawful and responsible gun owners who say, listen, I own multiple firearms that I built myself personally made firearms, as the Attorney General is calling them, homemade firearms. I built them myself. And uh, what do I need to do to continue to possess these after this rule goes into effect? And most people have been telling you, well, you need to go out and get them serialized. And that gets into a whole other issue as to whether or not that's even plausible or possible. Okay? No, you do not. Okay? If you are keeping possession of these firearms yourself under federal law, under the implementation of this, no, you do not have to serialize. Now, you may have state law. Here in Washington State, we have House Bill 1705. Any personally made firearm manufactured after July 1st, 2019 has to be serialized by March 10th, 2023. That's unique to Washington State law. Some other states, I'm sure, have some very unique laws too. But this piece of legislation does not have that dramatic and draconian effect on untraceable firearms that we first thought it did. Now, the other thing is, is what about untraceable firearms that are currently in inventory at FFLs? Now, this is unique to some states. In Washington State, you're not going to find a reputable FFL that has a firearm for sale that does not have a serial number on it. It just does not happen in Washington State by operation of law. But if you are in a state where that is permitted, uh, once this rule goes into effect, within 60 days of it going into effect, the FFLs, in order to maintain those items in the inventory, will, in fact, have to uh, mark them and have them serialized. Okay, the next nugget of information deals with silencers. 
For those of you who have been geeking out on this channel, you know that the ATF has been on a rampage when it comes to silencers, or as we call them here in Washington State, suppressors. They have basically denied every Form 1. Form 4 is really the only way to do it. And if you bought parts from companies like Diversified Machine, not only are you going to get rejected, you're probably going to get a nasty little letter from the ATF. Now, one of the things that we have done some videos on, and I'm not alone in doing these videos, is, is we believe that the ATF was about to implement a system where any component of a suppressor, any part that we were using to assemble a suppressor, a silencer, would have to be serialized, and that each part standing alone in and of itself would constitute a suppressor. And that was certainly the road that the ATF was going down. They appear to have changed their tune a little bit, and so when it comes to if we're form one that is, if we're manufacturing our own suppressor, what actually constitutes the frame that is the serialized part? Well, the ATF states as follows. In both the proposed and final rule, ATF required or requires only that the frame or receiver of a firearm muffler or silencer device be marked, and the final rule makes clear which part is the frame or receiver of a modular si silencer. Additionally, the final rule makes clear that the end cap of a silencer or a sound suppressor cannot be a frame or receiver. Based on public comments received in the ANPRM for silencers and mufflers, the final rule will not significantly change the way industry currently marks silencers. In most cases, the frame or receiver would be the outer tube. Now, whether or not the ATF actually sticks to this interpretation remains to be seen, but that should bring into cl some clarification for those of us or those of you who've been out there doing Form 1s on suppressors. It is the outer tube that is most likely going to need to be serialized, according to the ATF today. That's on page 261 of the report. All right, the next piece of information, of course, deals with Form 1 kits. Oh, my God, what is going to happen to Form 1 kits? Can we still get Form 1 kits? Yeah, we can. Now they're going to come with something that Form 1 kits currently don't come with, and that, of course, is a serial number. Uh, in response to thousands of comments about Form 1 kits, the ATF states as follows. Neither the proposed rule nor final rule requires the serialization of all PMFs in circulation. This aspect of the rule affects only firearm part kits with a partially complete frame or receiver held by FFLs and PMFs that are transferred through an FFL. Therefore, ATF accounts for only kits and PMFs held by FFLs or those that may go through them. So what they're saying is, is listen, if you built a firearm from a Form 1 kit, do you need to go back and serialize it? No, you do not. Now, if you're uh, a retail operation and you have Form 1 kits, and once this rule becomes effective, are you going to need to serialize them if you want to keep them in inventory? Yes, you are. The next issue we got to talk about is who's actually going to do the marking. Now, our big concern has been that this, of course, would require all sorts of new licensing, therefore all sorts of new expenses, of course, to be passed on to you, the consumer, or what I like to call the lawful and responsible gun owner. Now, the good news is, is that the ATF has broadly expanded the definition of gunsmithing and allowed people of various types of FFLs to engage in F, uh, into engraving or serialization. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is whether or not this is a good business decision for them, whether or not their insurance companies want them doing that, that remains to be seen. But this is what the ATF is telling us about what FFLs can and can't do, what they have to be or don't, what they don't have to be in order to do serialization. FFLs are not required to acquire equipment to serialize firearms. Should they choose to receive a personally made firearm from a non-FFL, the FFL could either require the individual to serialize the PMF prior to acceptance or directly oversee the engraving by another FFL or even a non-FFL. Personally made firearms that have been accepted into inventory prior to the effective date of this rule may also be outsourced for markings to a licensed manufacturer or gunsmith within the 60-day grace period. And again, that's on page 264 of the report. And again, so what you can see is what the ATF is claiming now. And again, do, do I take this as the gospel? No, we're talking about the ATF. But they are claiming that, listen, there's a lot of people that can do this if you're engaged in any act of gunsmithing, and gunsmithing now has a much more expanded definition, you can actually do the act of serialization or marking or engraving these firearms. Now, again, whether the FFLs find this to be a wise business move, that remains to be seen, but that is an important nugget to pull from this. 
Okay, the next couple of nuggets is what's the deal with frames and receivers? Now, as we know, there was all sorts of definitions kicking around for frames and receivers, and the comments was probably the most voluminous on this particular topic. Okay, now ultimately what ATF has chosen to do is break it down into two separate definitions, frame and receiver, depending on whether we're talking about a handgun or we're talking about a long gun. The ATF, and this is on page 292 of the report, and this is important, states the following. The final rule accepts the recommendation of numerous commenters and provides a new definition to remove and replace the terms firearm frame or receiver and frame or receiver. The definition set forth in the new section 478.12 separately defines frame for handguns and receiver for rifles, shotguns, and other weapons that expel a projectile other than handguns. So as you can see now under federal definitions, handguns will be talking about frames, long guns we're going to be talking about receivers. The ATF further states on the same page, rather than a definition that describes any housing for any fire control component, these definitions now describe only a single housing or structural component for one specific fire control component of a given weapon, including variants thereof, a term that is also defined. And listen, I cannot express to you the importance of this. This is huge, okay? And this is actually really good news because when the definition included any part of the fire control components, okay, you can imagine that now we are talking about upper receivers, bolt, bolt carriers, triggers, everything that needs it, because it's all necessary here, okay? And now instead what they're saying is, no, we're going to find the singular housing structure for what we believe, and that's going to be marked as the receiver. Now, if you guys want to geek out, again, when you look at the link in the description box, you can actually go down to the bottom and see the diagrams based on various firearms that they show in there, and they will show you what ATF believes to be the actual receiver, that is the regulated portion of that firearm. But there's more on this subject, including the following. For handguns, or variants thereof, it is the housing or structure for the primary energized component designed to hold back the hammer, striker, bolt, or similar component prior to the initiation of the firing sequence. Even if pins or other attachments are required to connect such components to the housing or structure. For rifles, shotguns, and projectile weapons other than handguns or variants thereof, it is the housing or structure for the primary component designed to block or seal the breach prior to initiation of the firing sequence. Even if pins or other attachments are required to connect such components to the housing or structure. And, and so the good news is, is that when we're talking about frames and receivers, frames for handguns, we are talking about this part right here, the part we expect to be talking about. And when we're talking about receivers for long guns, shotguns, and rifles, we are talking about these components right here, these parts, which is exactly what we would expect to see. And then also to clarify once again on silencers, what exactly is a silencer frame? It's the following. Specifically, the term frame and receiver means the housing or structure for the primary internal component designed to reduce the sound of a projectile, whether it's the baffle, baffling material, expansion chamber, or equivalent. Additionally, the term frame and receiver now exclude removable end cap and outer tube or modular pieces. So again, we are probably looking now more at these parts constituting a suppressor or silencer versus every single part. Now, I mentioned on a couple of occasions that gunsmithing had received an expanded definition so that more FFLs could actually engage in the act of serialization or marking the firearms. The eight, what does the ATF say about gunsmithing? It says the following. This rule finalizes with clarifying changes the proposed definition of engaged in the business as it applies to a gunsmith in Part 478. Most significantly, the final rule makes clear that licensed dealer gunsmiths are not required to be licensed as manufacturers if they only perform, perform gunsmithing services on existing firearms for their customers or for another's licensee's customers because the work is not being performed to create firearms for sale or distribution. And so again, that expanded definition now allows for more markings. Now, what about the timing? When do we have to bring everything, the stuff that we do have to bring into compliance with this rule, when do we have to bring it into compliance? Well, that depends on whether it's an NFA or non-NFA NFA item. And the ATF on page 297 of the report states, 
Also, the time limits to mark firearms differentiate in the final rule between non-FA complete weapons and frames or receivers disposed of separately, which must be marked within seven days after completion of the manufacturing process, and NFA firearms and parts defined as firearms, which must be marked by the close of the next business day. So once this rule takes effect, if you're manufacturing a regular firearm, you have seven days to mark it. If it's an NFA item uh, regulated by the NFA, you have exactly one business day to mark the item. So listen, that's some of the nuggets that I was able to pull out of the 364 pages authored by Merrick Garland about the implementation of these new rules. Now remember, rules were published April 11th. They're in effect 120 days later. That is August 10th of this year. The rules will go into effect. For those of you who are completely freaking out, thinking, oh my God, I got many, many untraceable firearms and now I have to have them all serialized, under federal law, that is not the case. If they go to an FFL and they stay overnight, they're going to have to get marked. But anything that you have in your personal circulation, in your personal possession, as long as it remains there, it is not subject to these rules. Let me repeat that. It is not subject to these rules. Now, for those of us out here in Washington, you need to pay careful attention to our videos on House Bill 1705 because we got a whole new amount of state regulations. And for those of you in other states, you have the responsibility to know what your state regulations are. Listen, you may have more questions about this or anything else related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com. Or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, let's remember, part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.